march of time. down on the equator, halfway around the world, where the Indian Ocean meets the South China Sea, are the most fabulously rich and coveted islands in the Far East, the Netherlands East Indies. Stretching from Singapore to the Antipodes, and at one point only 40 miles from the Philippines, the Netherlands Indies are a group of more than 20,000 abundantly fertile islands. The most important of them, Java, Sumatra and Borneo. Today, the people of the Dutch East Indies are making ready to resist invasion. For they know that with their motherland, a conquered state of Nazi Germany, their islands now are likely spoils of conquest. Because Dutch colonists most fear attack by their ruthless neighbor, Japan, they are hurriedly converting all their resources into armaments in a desperate attempt to discourage invasion by making it costly for the invader. From the lightning quick destruction of Holland's own great cities, Amsterdam and Rotterdam, they have learned the great lesson of modern warfare, that aerial bombs are the prime weapons of both offensive and defensive war. But key to all Japan's plans for a vast new empire are the Dutch East Indies. And with naval bases already established in the Spratly Islands to the north and Palau to the east, Japan is today in a position to strike. As a defense precaution, the Dutch have interned as dangerous enemy aliens the entire German population of the Indies. of moral encouragement and financial support to the people of the Indies has been London, where Holland's well-loved queen, 60-year-old Wilhelmina, fled for refuge. Here with her exiled ministers, Wilhelmina has been attempting to carry on the affairs of the Imperial Netherlands government, to hold together the great Dutch Empire scattered over the world, on the mainland of South America, in the American Indies, and in the China Seas an empire Nazi Germany is making every effort to destroy. German generosity and patience are not endless. The maltreatment of Nazis interned by the Dutch in the East Indies will bring swift reprisals. The Führer has ordered the military governor of the Netherlands to see that the Dutch under his authority are given some of their own medicine. In the Netherlands Indies live nearly 70 million brown-skinned subjects of the good Queen Wilhelmina. Of all the races inhabiting the Dutch Indies, best known to the world at large are the well-publicized and highly cultured people of Bali. Less spectacular, other inhabitants of the islands include 137 different racial strains. For the most part, a kindly and peaceable people, Mohammedan by religion, they live simply, deriving all they need from their immensely productive soil. Intelligent, skillful and moderately industrious, they make the utmost use of the products and resources they find around them. From generation to generation, they have preserved their tribal crafts. And in the course of centuries, they have produced masterpieces of minor art. Of native crafts, known is Javanese batik, fabrics richly patterned with the symbols of old Malayan sultans. Ruler over all the people and all the sultans in the Dutch East Indies is Queen Wilhelmina's governor general, Jonkier Tokauer, a mild and liberal autocrat.
Under him is the Volksrat, a sort of colonial parliament, half native and half Dutch, which has slight legislative powers, but serves as a forum where native deputies may air their views and know that they have at least a voice in their own government. Partial secret of the Dutch reputation as the world's most efficient colonizers is their ability to treat the natives not as subjects, but as citizens of the empire. In public and private schools throughout the East Indies, natives and Dutch study together, are equally encouraged to become proficient in those fields which will best fit them to serve in the future development of the colonies. Administered for a full century with tolerance and a far-seeing eye for profits, the Netherlands Indies have grown to be a rich field for investment. And the trade of the Indies has not only brought wealth to the Dutch people, but it has made one of the tiniest nations of Europe an important and respected world power. None have known better than the Dutch how to make productive use of the natural riches in which the Indies abound. No tobacco is more in demand than the delicate Sumatra, painstakingly cultivated to produce a large, fine leaf, which brings top prices in world markets as a wrapper for choice cigars. Scattered over the islands are thousands of acres of sisal, a tough, fibrous, tropical plant. Easy to grow and simple to harvest, the leaves of the sisal plant yield long, hemp-like strands which, when treated and dried, are spun into strong lines and heavy ropes. As tea planters, the Dutch colonists have been as successful as any in the East, and from the slopes of Java's volcanoes comes a delicate and fragrant leaf, which has done much to improve the blend of all Dutch tea. From the bark and roots of East Indian Sincona trees comes virtually the entire world's supply of quinine. Not a native of the East, the Sincona tree was transplanted to the Indies from South America by the far-seeing Dutch who, through careful cultivation and seed selection, have developed a rich monopoly. Of all the raw materials of modern industry and modern warfare, few are more essential than tin. And in the Dutch East Indies, America's chief source of supply of this all-important metal, whole islands are mountains of tin. Washing the ore from the soft earth is one of the easiest and most profitable of industrial operations. But even more vital to the nations of the world is another product of the East Indies, rubber. To ensure an uninterrupted supply of natural rubber from the few regions of the world which grow it is a major concern of every world power, most of all the United States. For upon East Indies rubber, U.S. industry today mobilizing to rearm America, is still heavily dependent. And the possibility that new conquests in Asia may entirely shut off America from access to the Indies is a serious worry to U.S. military strategists. In the same degree that Dutch tin to Japan's great military machine, with war and blockade gradually cutting down other sources of supply, Japan's militarists are demanding that they be given unlimited access to the oil fields of Borneo and Sumatra. But partners with the Dutch in the control of the East Indian oil fields are British American investors, whose interests are in direct conflict with those of Japan. For well do Europeans and Americans know to what grim purpose aggressor nation Japan employs its fuel oil and high-test gasoline. To carry on efficiently the affairs of Holland beyond the seas, the Dutch Queen Wilhelmina can count well on the loyalty of some 250,000 colonists, who, though spending their entire lives in the East, look always to the Netherlands, 9,000 miles away, as home. In Palembang, Surabaya, Batavia, Medan, or in Makassar, wherever in the East the Dutch family has settled, 
There it has preserved all the homeland customs, all the solid respectability and thrift that are the backbone of the Dutch character. First citizens in Dutch colonial life are its substantial burghers, businessmen who in carrying on the commerce and government of their empire are equally concerned with maintaining the social traditions of a hearty, convivial people. Of all European colonists in the Orient, the Dutch are the most democratic, most given to the simple pleasures of plain people. Into the quiet life of the Netherlands East Indies, early in May 1940, came a message. A group of three code words, bringing to a sudden end the peace and security of the Dutch colonists. Within five short days, Holland had been overrun by the German war machine. Quick to see an advantage in their neighbor's misfortune were Japan's militarists. England's difficulty is Japan's supreme and golden opportunity. We are working in the closest harmony with Italy and Nazi Germany. The United States is too weak and too pacifistic a nation to interfere with the onward march of Japanese destiny. Of course, we shall have the Dutch East Indies. As the people of the Netherlands Indies faced the gravest danger in the history of their empire, native sultans with ceremony and ritual reaffirmed their loyalty to the Dutch crown and the royal house of Orange. Dutch officials know that wholehearted native allegiance lightens the burden of defense. The problem before them seems almost insuperable. But in grim earnest, all the resources and industries of the rich Netherlands East Indies are for the first time diverted from the creation of wealth to the purposeful task of self-defense and self-preservation. upon the full capacity of every plant, factory, and shop, the colony of a nation which for decades had staked its national security upon its traditional neutrality and the might of friendly British sea power, faces the fact in 1940 that it must be prepared to fight alone for its own existence against an alliance of three great military dictatorships. <laughs> Knowing the limitations of their resources and their defenses, the Dutch staff is directing much of its effort to training soldiers able to cope with parachute invaders. Throughout the islands, the army is establishing anti-aircraft defenses wherever they will be most effective. Naval headquarters near Surabaya, staff officers are confident of being able to give good account of themselves in the shallow and treacherous waters of the Malayan archipelago, waters with which Dutch naval men have long been familiar. In the East Indies squadron, the Dutch have nearly a hundred surface craft, motor torpedo boats, destroyers, cruisers, gunboats. At the Surabaya naval base are more than 5,000 trained sailors and marines, some of them veterans of Germany's invasion of the Netherlands. <music> Bay 
based on Java is a flotilla of 18 modern submarines, outfitted with new long-range audio electric sound detectors. And from the Straits of Malacca to the Celebes Sea, the waters of every navigable channel have been thickly mined. Attached to the Navy are 60 German-made Dornier flying boats, capable of scouting, bombing, and mine-laying operations over a thousand-mile radius. And in the Indies is a third line of defense, a compact army air force of 3,000 men and nearly 300 combat planes. But Dutch colonials know that against the full force of a Japanese assault, they cannot hold out. Yet sober Indies Dutchmen hope that so long as America still stands guard in the nearby Philippines, Japan will not dare strike the blow by which she means to drive the white man forever from the Orient. Marches on.